Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured. But the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. So, faithfulness, fidelity. Um, what do we mean by that? Ross talks about promises. And we, we recognize that when we make a promise, like when we say the words, I promise, or we like sign our name, signature to something, we're committing ourselves, right? And why do we feel like that, that creates an obligation? Well, that's part of what it means to understand promising, according to, to, to Ross. Here's where it gets really interesting. Implicit promises. We make all sorts of explicit promises, don't we? Um, I'm going to show up at such and such a time. We make a lot more implicit promises. And those are also duties. They, they involve this sense of being obligatory on us. So what would be examples of implicit promises? He gives you a few examples here. An implicit understanding not to tell lies. Why? I mean, we, we could have some context in which telling lies is actually a good thing and is expected, couldn't we? Like, um, for example, um, this friend of mine who, who I, I saw at a conference recently told me that when he got to New York City, this is back in the 80s, that one of the things that everybody was just doing in the part of the city that, that he was living in was they would get together and they would just like BS each other. And each person would make up a biography and it was complete fabrication, you know, like who they knew, who they, who they worked with, what sort of thing they're into, where they're from. And everybody understood at the time that it was like a game. You know, and you try to make up a better story than the person before you. Now, imagine you're walking in off the street to, to a bar where all these, these people are sitting around coming up with these crazy stories, you would assume that they're true, wouldn't you? Because we naturally assume that when people are telling us things, they're actually giving us true information. We don't assume people to be lying to us because there's kind of an implicit promise in using language. We can abrogate that in certain situations, but most of the time we feel ourselves under an obligation to, to give correct information. Um, what else would that include? He says, writing books that purport to be history and not fiction. If you, if you write a book and it's actually supposed to be a history book, you're not supposed to make things up, right? You're supposed to actually have some, some possible way of verifying the things that you, you're talking about. On the other hand, if you're writing fiction um, and you're actually saying that this is not a true story, you probably shouldn't take an actual true story and represent it as being fiction, right? Then it's, you know, modeled after a true story or something like that. You can put a disclaimer in there. Um, so these are, these are uh, duties of, of fidelity. And he talks about a few more of these a little bit later. He says, um, there's special obligations arising from acts, the very intention of which, when they were done, was to put us under an obligation. That's at the core of, of fidelity. There's certain acts, by doing them, they put us under an obligation. So what would be examples of those in, in our lives? Let's think about the classroom. You hand in a paper. Are there any duties of fidelity sort of inherent in the very act of handing in a paper? Uh, plagiarism, like academic honesty. Yeah, you are you are you are presenting it as your own work. So now you can say, well, that's just a kind of lying to, to plagiarize, right? But it, it's also a kind of theft. 
Um, and and there's, there's a different kind of deception going on there. Now, um, sometimes professors make you actually, there's like a button you can click in iLearn where the student has to acknowledge the academic honor code and all that sort of stuff, um, which is like 70 pages long at this school. You know, I doubt anybody's actually read through the entire thing. Um, but you're committed to it. Or think about this. You've got, you know, smartphones <laughs> and other computer devices. Where are you actually making agreements all the time? Software updates, right? You have to agree to, every time you have a new iTunes, you have to click agree. How many of you actually read through all that verbiage? I don't, myself. I probably should. But I, I don't. Um, there's actually a South Park where terrible things happened to one of the characters because he didn't read the stuff. I won't tell you what it is because those of you who don't watch South Park might be horrified. Um, what else? What are other cases where we, we create an obligation for ourselves by, by actually choosing to take on an obligation? Where you have a duty of fidelity. What about if you get married? That would be an example. Um, I mean, at a very bare minimum, what is faithfulness in marriage? Is two hours or one in marriage? Is it two? Yeah. Thanks. Uh, nobody's lying to me about that, right? Notice, duty of fidelity there. Um, what, is, what is the baseline for that consistent? Don't screw anybody else. Just have sex with your partner. That's, that's pretty, that's, the bar is pretty low there, right? Um, what else might it include? Well, think about what wedding vows will often have in them. I so-and-so swear to do what? Clean up after you, um, cook your food, not alienate uh, your, your mom and dad and brother and sister. It doesn't include stuff like that. It's a law, right? Usually the vows, I hope, include that sort of thing. Love and cherish, to be true to one. Those are all obligations that a person is taking on to themselves in, in doing that. If they don't want to you know, feel bound by that, don't get married, right? Because that's, that's what these vows usually entail. What are other situations where you're taking on an obligation? I took on an obligation when I agreed to teach this class. I'm going to sh actually, you know, like show up, and not just tell personal anecdotes, and actually, you know, have some material for you, and have you do something connected with the material. You're supposed to learn something in the class. There's there's obligations involved with that. Um, do you have any obligations like that you've taken on with your friends? Are there implicit promises? And friendship. What do you think? Yeah. That you'll be genuine. Okay. That you won't conceal who you are. And what you, what you think. think. Yeah, I, th I think that's right. Yeah. You'll be loyal. You won't stab them in the back. Yeah. Now you know. Uh, oftentimes, when when fights occur, somebody will say, "Well, I never promised not to stab." <laughs> Back, right? But you can say, look, that's what it means to be a friend. When you became a friend with me, if you're Ross, you made an implicit promise not to stab me in the back and when the opportunity arose. What were you going to say? Uh, you're not going to tell someone else everything they're telling you. Yeah, that goes along with the honesty part, doesn't it? You, you confide in a friend. That, that confiding in a friend actually, I guess Ross would say, produces a duty of fidelity to not reveal that information to, to other people. Um, there's probably a lot of other duties to not reveal that we could talk about in that respect. Like, you know, doctor patient, um, particularly for psychiatric uh, things, counselors. Um, any other ones? Like lawyers have, have obligations like that. Uh, there's certain professions that just by entering into the profession, you are taking on a whole set of implicit promises, which you might you might break, right? And everybody else might break, but it's still recognizable as a breach of fidelity. Um, that is, here's, here's one other thing I want to say about this. 
Ross thinks that duties of fidelity are, are what he's willing to call perfect duties. They have a high degree of what he calls stringency. So they're not reducible to things like it turns out better for everybody else if you, know, if you follow through on your duties. They're not reducible to anything else other than the fact of having incurred an obligation. And by virtue of having incurred an obligation, this should take priority over other things. So for example, if the duty of fidelity were to come in, in conflict with beneficence, like if by breaking my promise I could make a number of other people happy, um, let's say for example, that is very far-fetched. I'm married, right? So I should be true to my wife. Uh, we we want to make this about um, like you know sexual cheating. There's what they call emotional affairs, right? Um, emotional affairs are where you there's actually uh, laws about this in the South about estrangement of affection. Have you ever heard this term? It's an interesting term. It means that if I'm uh, at least at a literal level, if I'm involved with you know my wife, she has a right to expect affection from me, and that my affection is not going to somebody else instead. That other person who gets my affection has estranged my affection from my, my wife, like by seducing me, for example. So let's say instead, uh, there's no you know, hanky-panky. I decide I'm a good listener, you know? And I can, you know, I can like get on the internet and maybe make a whole bunch of people happy. Maybe, you know, it's not even just women. Women and men all listen to their stuff and will have this very close emotional connection and um, I won't have time for my wife as a result. But, you know, it's, I'm helping out like eight other people. I'm really improving their life by doing so. That's, you know, that's meeting a duty of beneficence because I'm improving their condition. Not only say it just with pleasure, Ross would say, but I'm making them better people. Well, I'm still breaking an implicit promise to like not give other people priority over my spouse. And this has a greater weight, this has a greater stringency, Ross would say. There's a lot of cases where by you know, fudging our promises or breaking them, we could probably make a lot of people happy, but we probably shouldn't do that as a result. Um, Non-maleficence is a different kind of story. If by keeping my promise, I'm going to produce great harm to another person, I should break the promise. So for example, with, with confiding in a friend, right? If you confide in, in me that you actually plan to, um, if you were a sniper, where would you go on the rest? Um, like probably the roof of the hand kind of building, right? That'd be a, a good location. Um, that you were actually going to do that. And you know, I know that you actually have a rifle and you've got like ammo out in the car. I know you're serious about this. And you say, look, I don't want anyone else to know, but I really respect your, you know, your, your opinion and your friendship, and I just wanted to tell you, you know, before I, I, I go, I'm going to go kill a whole bunch of people. I should tell somebody, right? I should say, oh, well, duty of fidelity. Better not say anything. No, non-maleficence trumps fidelity in cases like that. Um, if, if a friend were to reveal that they are engaging in, you know, very risky or harmful behavior, Maybe then I should, I should also notify somebody else, even though it breaks the confidentiality. You know. um, are there cases where I should lie? You know, there, there's the proverbial case of the, the, the killer in the maternity ward you know, who wants to know where the babies are so he can, he can kill all of them. You tell him the opposite direction, right? And you don't even need to really think about it. And you don't say to yourself, oh, I, you know, I feel really conflicted because I have this duty of, of fidelity not to tell lies. No, in that case, that's a good thing to do. Um, why? Well, describe what you're actually doing. You are protecting. It's not that you're lying so much. It's that you're protecting innocent lives. That's a better description of what you're attempting to do, isn't it? So duties of fidelity are going to be pretty strong in comparison to these other duties, but non-maleficence will usually trump it. Um, duties of reparation often arise when you break a duty of fidelity.